Hello, everyone. Um, we have Akhil here with us today. Uh, Akhil's pronouns are he and him. And uh, this is a very interesting conversation. It's a little offbeat as well. Um, Akhil is a co-founder and director of uh, Center for Gender and Politics, uh, CGAP. And uh, his mission is to narrow the research gap on gender and electoral politics in South Asia. In the past two years, he has successfully mobilized about 100 volunteers from South Asia, empowering them to um, contribute to the cause of gender inclusive politics. Um, he's passionate about promoting responsible politics and has worked with local governments in India as well, um, where he has designed and implemented large scale public programs. So I think. Um, this is a very different and a very nuanced kind of work that you're doing, Akhil. Um, and um, uh, it would be really interesting to understand some of your experiences around um, working uh, uh, with gender and politics and what is the you know, difference, et cetera, that you see. Um, and some of the challenges and perhaps even the solutions you know, that you've come up with. So, um, Currently, I mean, just speaking from the current state of affairs, um, firstly, where do you see the, uh, you know, the entire uh, thing with respect to women and politics go? Is it shifting? Is it going backwards? Or are we just maintaining status quo for the last uh, however many years? Great. Um, thank you so much for having me, Shivangi. Um, so, so with my work at Center for Gender and Politics, I've been tracking the status of women, particularly in political spheres in South Asian context for the last three years. So while tracking South Asian context, I also look at you know, global trends and how each player, be it civil society or political parties or governments or you know, even the legal and constitutional uh, you know, bodies such as election commissions are taking efforts to improve the scene. So as far as you know, the current situation goes with respect to women in politics, it is far behind what we imagine it should be. But I can definitely say that you know, the world, uh, you know, all over, we are seeing you know some significant strides being made. We are having more and more you know, strong and inspiring women leaders taking the roles of you know head heads of government, heads of states across across the world, across the regions. But when it comes to South Asia particularly, although there are you know a lot of you know developments which happen at this intersection of gender and politics, we often don't hear about them much. Again in the global discourse, you know, the global north or the Western and developed countries discourse takes precedence as it is with you know other sphere other spheres. So when we talk about women in politics, we would often talk about or read articles on Jacinda or New, you know, Germany, New Zealand, Finland, and women leaders leading uh, the countries in the West. In the development, uh, you know, in the developing world's context, despite uh, you know having the challenges that come with you know, developing countries' context. Women leaders in South Asia are, you know, overcoming these challenges and emerging as leaders. But but they're often looked at as vic victims. And whenever they are described in the larger discourse, discourse, we we talk about challenges they face, but not really about how they are overcoming, which provides solutions and inspiration to the whole new generation who are aspiring to get into politics. So that's where our interest began in South Asia and we have started working on it. And during the process, it's not just the narrative or discourse gap that we noticed, but there's also significant research gap in terms of, you know, as simple as what motivates women voter, what motivates women to get into politics, why should women consider politics as a career choice. All of these nuances are not really well known in South Asian context, which is what we are trying to bridge in terms of research in South Asian context. So apart from research, there are other aspects such as providing training, capacity building, doing advocacy, which a lot of nonprofits and 
of individuals across South Asia have been doing, and this is contributing to improving the situation uh, in Indian and South Asian context. Actually, you know, that's a very important point, and I think uh, often when we talk about gender and politics, usually uh, in India, I mean, for argument's sake, people have a habit of going back to um, uh, Sundara Gandhi's time or Benazir Bhutto's time. And if you really see, those were also, I mean, way too many years back. Um, okay. And I'm thinking that um, what is it that's, uh, you know, stopping Indian women even now? Because if you look at different industries, there are lots of strides that have been made, right? Um, but when you really look at politics, um, we still don't see a lot of women at leadership positions. Well, there are, of course, a couple of uh, politicians, surely, that we can name currently. Uh, but there aren't still as many, perhaps, as we would like to have. So where do you think the gap lies and why aren't women choosing this as, as a matter of profession or practice? Great, great. Uh, there are a number of challenges. One, of course, the main challenge is the societal structures, the patriarchal structures, which limit some professions to you know, women, in, if you look at it uh, from that sense. Uh, we did have many uh, inspiring women leaders in the past, and, uh, you know, the examples you mentioned are often uh, referred as exemplary figures in Indian politics when we talk about women in politics. Uh, you know, apart from the societal patriarchal structures, the entry barriers for any youth itself to enter politics is high that coupled with you know all other uh, structures that are and discrimination that is already present in society towards women makes it doubly difficult for women to access politics as a career choice and uh, one important uh, aspect that we noticed is also that you know lack of role models we don't talk about women in politics very positively. If you look at media discourse on women in politics, e even the finest interviewer would ask questions such as, oh, how do you manage household and political job? So with, you know, such questions never get asked to men in politics, right? So, um, so, so that's where the nuances of what it takes to work in politics goes missing when we focus on the wrong questions, right? And uh, at CGAP, that inspired us to take up this annual interview series called Worth Asking. So we ask questions that matter. We ask questions to explore in depth about politics as a career choice for women. So if a young woman who's aspiring to join politics is reading that interview, she would understand not just the challenges being faced by a woman leader, but also how they are overcoming in order to excel in politics. And one other thing that's missing in the entire discourse is about the role of men's allyship, because unfortunately today, uh, and, and in reality, the politics as a career is dominated by men, and uh, they are in leadership position, positions. But we do have some role models there who act as allies, who promote women within their political parties, within their constituencies. So we do not talk enough about the role of allyship and how we can strengthen the role of allyship because we have uh, many men out there and we need their support in, in changing the structural barriers or reducing the st structural barriers uh, when it comes to accessing politics as a career. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, on this note, I, I suddenly remembered that whenever I'm conducting posh uh, related sessions as well, <clears throat> um, uh, there is a specific mention that I make and people tend to like really agree with this aspect of things as well. Um, I don't use Twitter a lot, but a couple of times that I have gone or uh, you know, visited Twitter, and um, especially if there are any politicians, comments, etc., that uh, if in case I've ended up seeing, there are so many and indefinite rape threats and threats related to 
sexuality and and threats related to person's sex life and all of that i i wonder and and i guess you are the right person to ask this question do you think that women face this uh, exponentially or differently or do you think that the in in terms of threats and especially sexual threats is it the same across Right. Uh, yes, uh, you are very right. I mean, the research all over also does show that women face these threats disproportionately higher than men, and they are gendered in nature. Just because of their gender, they are ought to face a certain nature of a threat. Right, and it ranges from physical threats to psychological threats, and uh, you know the. the emergence of social media has only been uh, used negatively by certain forces to demean women and limit their presence in public life um, so so we definitely need you know, many forces coming together to solve this problem on one hand government strengthening the you know digital laws and all of that on the other hand political parties taking initiatives to sensitize their cadre uh, many women leaders that i have engaged with or we interviewed at cgap have repeatedly said that you know men are in leadership positions and uh, you know their voice does have you know a lot of weight so they can convince and sensitize their followers and the party cadre to act differently to women to respect women to engage responsibly on social media and other digital platforms so there is definitely you know scope for improvement but it requires concerted effort from you know across the quarters there are these big giant social media companies as well which are trying to strengthen um, you know mechanisms to prevent such hate and uh, uh, you know dangerous uh, threats right so, but it, Does require a lot of people coming together to solve. Yeah, that's absolutely right, and I think uh, post such uh, hateful messages, I think the social media companies have also become really active as far as uh, protecting uh, you know people's rights are also concerned, and I think the reporting mechanism has also definitely become much better. um that's true but i think it still doesn't take away from the core that you know people still end up abusing very sexually when it comes right. to women and as you rightly said it becomes very gendered especially because of right. that so yeah. and and i it's actually on that note it brings me to the question also of uh, you know what are some of the initiatives that you all are taking um especially given that you also work with local governments so how uh, you know does that piece look like what are the initiatives and what have your experiences been like right um right so so many initiatives that we take fall under the um, you know three large buckets one you know doing research understanding the issue in a more nuanced way or you know in more depth so we'll be able to develop solutions better second in terms of creating awareness about politics as a career choice for women and the role of men's allyship in indian politics the third is really about convening different stakeholders uh, and and uh, you know trying to advocate for improved status for women in politics so so under the convening vertical we do a lot of round tables bringing in stakeholders from across south asia from politicians to researchers to academicians to practitioners um, right and uh, under the research aspect we try and bring anecdotal instances you know into research practice for example very recently we conducted a research study where we tracked self help group women entering politics and what are those mechanisms that are enabling this political effort all over um, you know many of our partners and you know many grassroots non profits have anecdotally seen that many women from self help groups are entering panchayats but nobody 
really studied what is enabling the transition. So, so we take up such research projects to understand, you know, the enablers and disablers if there are any, and accordingly we can pitch to governments and other stakeholders that are on the ground to improve the situation. So, and and under the vertical of awareness, we take up, you know. We curate stories of inspiring women leaders from across South Asia. We publish annual editions of these stories and try and translate them into local languages. We have in the past translated to Urdu, Hindi, Marathi, Bengali, and you know, we also engage with local nonprofits in India, Bangladesh, Nepal, etc. To you know, to to create awareness of these stories. So, so anybody who is wanting to enter politics can have more role models that are women, right? And yeah, so these are the kind of initiatives that we largely work on at CKM. Yeah, that sounds really, really wonderful. And um, I'm wondering that uh, if this is the current state of affairs with uh, women, so where do you see the LGBT QIA plus community being currently? Right. Um, so there are instances where political parties and uh, other stakeholders are taking efforts in terms of improving political representation of the community, but it's still you know way lesser than the number of initiatives that we see for women in politics. We started out as this initiative called Women for Politics and we evolved as Center for Gender and Politics. And the reason for you know, not sticking with Women for Politics, but we registered ourselves as Center for Gender and Politics is primarily because we wanted to look at gender more comprehensively, look at non-binary persons, trans people, their political participation representation. Well, that's the case. We have also seen initiatives uh, taken by political parties. There have been political parties which appointed transgender uh, people in their leadership positions as spokespersons. There's also one political party uh, in Maharashtra which has set up LGBTQ wing within the party, just like we have women's wings across political parties. So these initiatives are definitely pioneering in, the, in their own sense. And we have to see more of that happening uh, in order to really shift or you know, put more emphasis and focus on LGBTQ plus and their political engagement in the country. So uh, from everything that's been happening so far, so. Uh, would you say that, um, in your view, the local governments are uh, accepting of these inclusion efforts and changes that are happening? Um, yes, yes, definitely, very much. So, it's you know starting from 1991, 1992, when 73rd, 74th amendments were introduced, India introduced this quota system for women in local panchayats, right, and. Uh, now almost 20 states in India have increased that quota from minimum of 33% to a minimum of 50%. So, so there is that uh, you know very uh, pos you know radical positive shift that has happened in the last three decades, and uh, we have also uh, shifted from a situation in the 90s where women who come to politics through quotas were just being proxies of their husbands and uh, male members of the families to them running panchayats and local governments independently. So we have also seen that kind of shift and research has uh, confirmed that in Indian context. Uh, so definitely there is uh, more and more acceptance when it comes to local governments and uh, um, there are also, you know, I think today close to 1.4 million women, elected women representatives at local governments. So it is only going to, I think, uh, you know, trickle up the ladder. We have 1.4 million in local governments, but we only have 78 
women in Lok Sabha, right? And uh, so all of this population at the grassroots, I think, would uh, eventually be empowered or, you know, when, when systems start to change, it will only trickle up across the leadership levels from the local to state and, and then the national level. Actually, what you said also reminded me of the TV show Panchayat, because I think they've shown a very similar thing where um, the woman is actually the proxy for the husband. Um, okay. But uh, but this is really nice to know that there are those kind of numbers uh, you know that, that we have now. And, um, and it's great to also see that uh, it's moving towards a positive change. So so that's a that's a good one. Um, before we go, um, Akhil, anything else that you'd like to share with uh, anybody who might be watching this video? Sure. Um, yes, yeah, so one one thing is uh, that this space, especially in terms of working uh, towards gender inclusion in political space is very, very uh, niche in its own sense. So if, if you are uh, a believer of you know, the potential of politics in bringing change, in bringing gender equality to the larger society, I would urge all of you to choose the initiatives, individuals and nonprofits that work in the space and start contributing. We are very much at CGAP. Uh, we are a volunteer led organization. We were joined by more than 100 volunteers across India and South Asia uh, in producing all the work we have produced so far. I would love to see many of you joining our efforts and others efforts in this area. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Akhil, for that. And uh, thank you for joining us. I think um, it was a really uh, interesting conversation and, uh, and a much needed one. So thank you. Thank you for having me.